Dr. K.C. Singh, a former senior diplomat who retired from the Indian Foreign Service after nearly 40 decades of work, uh, retired in 2008. And uh, we are, this is the Prince soft cover, which is its soft publishing arm. Uh, and I am very privileged to interview Ambassador K.C. Singh on his book. So I'm going to hold it aloft. And Ambassador, I would request you to do that. So it's called The Indian President, an insider's account of the Zail Singh years. So I'd urge you viewers to go out and buy a copy. It's a fascinating account, not just of the time when Ambassador Casey Singh as a young diplomat worked with the former president, Gyani Zail Singh in the mid 1980s. And I will of course uh, let him uh, talk to you about, uh, talk to us a little bit about that, but also about the role of the president as it is enshrined in the constitution. Uh, and there are several stories about how several presidents over the years from Rajendra Prasad uh, soon after independence and right uh, down to the present moment, although Ambassador Singh does not include the current uh, president naturally or the previous ones, but I, will, I, I won't come in the way, Ambassador. Welcome to the print. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jyoti. Always a pleasure talking to you and to the print. Thank you. Uh, let me just start by asking you the first very obvious question. This is a book uh, and it says very interestingly on the cover and inside his account of the Zell Singh years. So tell us a little bit about that. You were intimately involved or you were an intimate um, observer of that period of time. Tell us about that. You see, I joined the uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan in 1983, end of 83, as the Commonwealth Summit was about to take place. Yeah. And that's why there are two pictures uh, where the Queen, uh, late Queen Elizabeth is there with the President and I'm somewhere in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, first phase was till Mrs. Gandhi was there. That is when I was reporting literally to my, directly to my boss, uh, Joint Secretary to the President, who was very close to the President, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. I.S. Pindra, who later became uh, uh, Chairman of the Board of Cricket Control of India, and he was really intimately involved with cricket. Right. And then in 2005, after Rajiv Gandhi takes over, Mr. Bindra had completed by then five years in Delhi because he came with the president in 1980 when he became home minister. Mm -hmm. So five years were complete and it was expected he'll get an extension. President had asked Arun Singh, who was the intermediary in uh, talking to Rajiv Gandhi. And Arun Singh assured him that, yes, as you have seen, every president, you know, keeps anybody. Uh, Amita Paul was with uh, Pranam Mukherjee way past her retirement age, way after retiring, mm -hmm. and continue till the end. So presidents are given that freedom. Uh, but right in the middle of 85, they said, no, Pindra can't get an extension, and he's leaving. That that was the first signal that mm -hmm. things were not right between uh, uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and President, because there's not much of a demand. So right. after Mr. Bindra left, he, uh, President Singh did not ask for another joint secretary as replacement. Mm -hmm. And I was literally... Uh, made to do then the Joint Secretary's job. Right. So I was, uh, now you have half a dozen officers, additional secretaries, Joint Secretaries attached to President there. At that time, there's only Secretary to the President and myself. Right. So which was then from 85 to 87, two years, uh, was great uh, experience because I traveled with the President domestically. Yeah. Either the Secretary traveled, but whenever the Secretary didn't travel, I was a senior staff officer, civilian officer who went with him mm -hmm. all over India. And that was a great education uh, seeing his interactions, public speeches, how uh, CMs behave with them, and so on and so forth. Uh, that is actually the period which, which is really critical uh, because it's during Rajiv Gandhi's time mm -hmm. that the lack of communi communication and the lack of respect that a prime minister should show the president began to disappear. And you realize that uh, the prime minister was behaving as if there was no president. So why did uh, that happen he... and how did that happen, Ambassador? Look, that's what the book recounts. Obviously, the seeds had been sown much earlier. Right. Uh, my assessment is that Mrs. Gandhi, as was usual in every state and usual in her secretariat, had at least two groups around her. Mm -hmm. uh, one was led by R.K. Dhawan, a special assistant, extremely powerful bureaucrat, uh, before he, whom even the cabinet minister shivered. And the other was uh, the group led by M.L. Fotedar, who was a political advisor to Mrs. Gandhi, and therefore provided a counterweight. So she would listen to both of them. She would listen to this guy's view, listen to their complaints. And that is her way of balancing her aides, have two different camps, and then she could decide who was right and who was wrong. 
and take a decision. And she had done the same thing in the states. That's why you've had uh, multiple groups in states. And Congress, her successors, subsequently have had a difficulty handling it. Mm -hmm. Because if a prime minister does not have a connect with the state, where directly with the people, then those factions become powerful. And you can't sideline them. And particularly as Congress is realizing today, when you don't have power at the center, now what do you do with a pilot in Rajasthan? Or what do you do with a dissident or Huda in Haryana? Right. So then you, you, you're left with them in the same state and they're going at each other. And you're not powerful enough to control them. So in the Prime Minister's office, as soon as uh, Mr. Gandhi took over, mm -hmm. he got rid of Dhawan. Not only got rid of him, but uh, allegations were leveled against him that, you know, inquire whether he's involved in the conspiracy to assassinate Mrs. Gandhi. I mean, there could be no greater unkind cut for a man who doted on Mrs. Gandhi and was her shadow uh, right. to even have this charge leveled. And then no one asked when this charge was removed and Rajiv, Rajiv Gandhi again uh, took him back towards the end and when he was out of power. But then nobody cares. At that point, you know, that man was destroyed. But as a result, the other group became very powerful. And that was always opposed to Gyaniji, who perceived Gyaniji as close to Dhawan. Mm -hmm. So this alignment, I think, must have been since before Mrs. Gandhi, Gandhi's assassination. So Rajiv harbored certain impressions, which I don't think Gyaniji was very, very shrewd at assessing people. Mm -hmm. I think the only person he wrongly assessed was Rajiv Gandhi. He took his social mannerism, uh, you know, very polite way of speaking as goodness of heart, as feelings of warmth towards him. Mm -hmm. When he, Rajiv was just observing social niceties and though those did not betray what his real assessment was and it be, only became uh, obvious after he became prime minister and there lies, that's the core of the book. What does a president do when a prime minister has a huge majority and then tends to become autocratic? and uh, does not behave correctly with the president. What does the president, you know, either the president resigns or reconciles and just, you know, kind of touches the prime minister's feet right. or he ignores it till the winds change and then sorts the prime minister out. And mm -hmm. that is what this story is about. How a president who began by saying, I would even sweep the floor if Mrs. Gandhi asked me, that means from an arch courtier right. to an arbiter, how did he reach a position of becoming an arbiter again, where he became the referee in, in Rajiv Gandhi's problems as he ran into political difficulties, is what this story is about, which means the power is inherent in the post of the president. So presidents who say, but what can I do? You know, I couldn't have done anything else. Let, let me, let me hold That's not good enough. Let, let me hold your thought. And this is such a fascinating story. Like you said, an arch courtier of Indira Gandhi. Like you said, that he was ready to sweep the floor uh, of the ground on which he walked to the to this uncomfortable relationship with Rajiv Gandhi, then prime minister. So I'm not going to ask you to, to give away the book, but give us one example of the discomfort between Rajiv's, you know, and especially since he sort of presided over his huge majority in the Lok Sabha after his mother's assassination and Gyani Zel, Zel Singh, the president. No, he, he just stopped meeting the president. You know, president, as per the constitution, has to be kept informed. And as you know, there was that espionage scandal where bulk of the leakage was taking play, place from PMO. PC Alexander, principal secretary, had to resign. So there had been a whole group of people there who were taking documents from PMO and uh, going near Connaught Place, getting wine and dined and uh, companionship of women. And uh, East German spies, they just photocopied everything from telegrams to cabinet papers to everything else. Uh, now, some of the telegrams from Rashwati Bhavan, which were under my control, also got copied because my PA made a mistake of trusting another PA who was part of that group. So it ruined my PA's life. But the PA had made a mistake of letting him borrow a telegram, copies of which were under my control. And a few copies, photocopies of those telegrams were found when the IB raid took place. Uh, although the originals were with us, but you could make out from my underlining that these had been copied. Mm -hmm. Now, Rajiv Gandhi arrives for 26th of January uh, in North Court, is walking with the president literally four inches ahead of him and very haughtily asked him, uh, what is the action you're taking in this matter? Now, the question is, it's all the big volcano is in your office. It was under your mother. You know, we only got a fringe thing, some telegrams. So Gyaniji very 
uh, you know, matter of factly told uh, told him, don't worry, we'll take whatever action is required. But mm -hmm. then Rajiv Gandhi used that to cut off communication, top secret telegrams, stop coming to Rajpati Bhavan. Well, they didn't stop going to PMO. So, you know, if something like this happened, you basically cauterize the leak which is there. But right. you don't cut off communication. And they stopped uh, keeping the president informed. Punjab Accord, okay, I can understand in Punjab, uh, they didn't trust Gyani Ji. A Sam Accord, he had been a home minister. You don't tell the president, even keep him informed before you go public. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is all against the constitution. Is the president's right to be known, uh, to be told what is happening? And then his advice, he has the right to give the advi tender advice if he desires. You can ignore it. But certainly he has the right to give advice and to be kept informed. And so they cut him off completely. They behaved as if the president was in Rashtrapati Bhavan only as a formality, only to be used for public functions. At the pleasure. Uh, but he was not. Mm -hmm. Yes, but he was not required for any substantive duty. Now you quote this uh, lovely this story, and you quote the uh, journalist Veer Sangvi, who's also a columnist at the Print, uh, in an interaction or an interview between Rajiv Gandhi and Veer, uh, where Rajiv is critical of the president of Gyani Ji, and when Manish Ankarayar, who is then also posted along, who is a close confidant of uh, his friend uh, Rajiv Gandhi, says to Mani says to Rajiv. Well, I think you've spoken a little bit too much. And Rajiv responds by saying, what did I say? What about all the womanizing in Rashtrapati Bhavan? Is that correct, Ambassador? Look, uh, there, there are no women that I saw coming in, but I was not privy to President's personal life. I was dealing with his official life. Uh, these were the same allegations which I have recounted in the book, which I had incidentally dictated even earlier, which were leveled against him when his name was seriously considered. But what Mrs. Gandhi did, what I've recounted in the book is, they seat, she seated both the groups, uh, Fotedar on one side and Dhawan and Bindra on the other. And he said, now level the charge. Kya bola tha aapne? Fotedar sahab kya kya rahe the? Achha, now in the company of uh, Dhawan and Bindra, naturally they're going backwards. Because you can do loose talk and uh, rumor mongering. But when, you con when you're confronted, you don't have any proof. This is just hearsay. You mm -hmm. could say there was similar hearsay about the Prime Minister. If I had to level charges, you could level charges against anyone. So the fact that the Prime Minister of the country harbors such feelings and says such things uh, to a journalist itself showed that he held him in utter contempt and uh, absolutely thought that this was a mistake his mother had made. And so the story is how that very person, as India Today, I think I've quoted India Today and that said that you know, when he was asked that would there be more letters written or would you be meeting the president uh, more often when the Haryana results came and they won five out of the 90 plus seats, four till late evening and the fifth was Bhajan Lal's uh, uh, wife or widow who won late at night, five in a house of 90 plus. He came running the next day. So India Today commented that the need seemed to have arisen rather quickly <laughs> after that last meeting. So, you know, as your political capital depletes very rapidly, Mm -hmm. Then you discover the constitutional niceties. Then you discover that you have to observe form. Then you pretend that there is warmth. Uh, whereas there was none of that for four years. But when your political fortunes uh, uh, start diminishing, that is when the role of the, suddenly you require the president. And you start getting, th you know, people started spreading the story. And Gyaniji was, of course, uh, not about to deny it. So if the prime minister is getting scared by it or rattled, he played the psychological game on him that he was going to dismiss him. So this thing started going around. Uh, and I've recounted how, you know, a few times I brought someone and I told him not to tell him that. And he did told him exactly that because he knew this story will be carried back. So he was playing a public game. He was playing a political game. He was playing a psychological game. So he used all the weapons, array of weapons that he required in his rise from a very small worker in the free court state uh, all the way to uh, an office that once uh, a building the viceroy occupied uh, and he showed are... how yeah yeah no go ahead showed how no showed how you know in india uh, a skilled politician who's gone up he obviously has he may not use those skills in rashtrapati bhavan but i'm sure most presidents 
have had that skill set, uh, but most of them never employed that so uh, sense, for various reasons. So in a sense, as a skilled politician, I mean, Rajiv was really like putty in his hands, wasn't he? He, he was almost like a novice. No, Rajiv had been uh, in training since Sanjay's death. So he, he had worked with Mrs. Gandhi. Mrs. Gandhi had trained him. And they had been interfering. I, I'm sure the sacking of uh, N.T. Rama Rao was not Mrs. Gandhi is doing. Uh, they might have convinced her, but I think it was starting somewhere else. Similarly, uh, the Kashmir thing, I've recounted that in some detail, where the whole Kashmir problem starts. Now, the president goes to Kashmir. He's met a wide array of people. He comes back and the prime minister has no need to meet him or even consult him that what is, what is his impression? No, nothing at all. And you go and then, uh, you know, conduct an, uh, an election, which we know was the starting point of militancy and alienation of the people. Gyaniji, if he had been asked, would have told him. He, in fact, told uh, Farooq that don't, don't join the Congress because, you know, you are a pressure valve in the Kashmir Valley and your value will go down if you join the Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, so he would have given that advice. And that is the role of a president as an elder that he advises, he warns, the Prime Minister is free to still do it. But a seasoned politician giving you a view, because he meets a wider array of people. He meets opposition leaders who come and complain to him. He meets journalists. He meets common people. He travels all over India, which Prime Ministers can't always do with the same freedom. Mm -hmm. Because the President has much more time. He goes and stays in... Uh, there's a southern Rashtadi Bhavan, as most people don't know, in Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. uh, so he goes and spends some winter months there. Uh, then people meet him. So South feels connected because the president has two residences. The prime minister doesn't. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a role which was devised as a, unite, a role of a uniter. And as I said, as his oath says, as the defender of the constitution, the prime minister's oath doesn't say that. Prime minister is required to abide by the constitution. President is required to defend it. So how do you do it if, if, if you don't... Uh, uh, you know, act and behave with a certain degree of independence. But having said that, Ambassador, would you not say that perhaps Gyaniji overstepped his role in the constitution? You know, his discomfort with the prime minister, he is an elected prime minister after all. So this admonishing or this, um, or this chastising, if you like, directly or indirectly, that may have also made Rajiv feel small and inadequate. No, no, Rajiv was intention was to make him feel small because he had been maltreating him for the last three years. Uh, so any president will want to restore a certain dignity to his, to his office. And he restored it. It's not that he abused him. Uh, he held up his postal bill. And the postal bill, which was uh, envisioned during Mrs. Gandhi's time, and then they had it on the back burner, was uh, nothing but trying to open everybody's letters or anybody's letters. So when Rahul Gandhi today complains, and I tweeted about it, complains in London about democracy being endangered in India, does he know what his father was trying to do? Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you bring a postal bill with the right to open anybody's letters, wasn't democracy endangered then? Uh, or you stand up on the floor of the house and say, I've been keeping the president informed when that's a lie. And when a privilege motion starts, then you start running around using the speaker and the chairman uh, to cover it up. And mm -hmm. the president writes a letter and says, this is far from the truth. You know, three and a half years, don't, don't keep him informed. And he gave instances. And you stand up on the floor of the house and say, but I've kept the president. So who is belittling whom? So the president merely caught him where he was transgressing boundaries, either laid down by the constitution or where is the president, certain respect is due to the president. Mm -hmm. So let I'm going to uh, show you, show our viewers this book again. Uh, and to just to make the point that Ambassador Casey Singh's book, while it has this really fascinating chapter and, and more than a chapter about uh, the life and times of Gyani Zail Singh in the uh, president's, uh, in, in Rashtrapati Bhavan, but it's more than that. But before I uh, talk to you about the other president's uh, ambassador, tell me, give us a flavor of the time. This is in the wake of Operation Blue Star, June 1984. Uh, you are with the president, Gyani Zail Singh, at the time, and uh, he wants to go to the Golden Temple, the holiest seat of the Sikhs. Tell us what happened. Look, they were obviously delaying it because the operation took longer than was uh, expected. And Mrs. Gandhi told him as much 
when she met him later and said, they had not told me there'll be so much of damage. Um, so obviously even she felt that the, she had been misled because they told, told him that it'll be over very quickly and there'll be minimal damage. And by the end of it, they, you know, it took much longer than expected. And the loss of material loss and loss of lives, injuries to the soldiers and to the officers on this side was tremendous for, for an operation that size. Uh, so, Gyaniji, uh, they delayed it till they were able to clear it. And even that day when we went, uh, an odd sh shot was being fired from outside the Parikarma, mm -hmm. uh, the Langar side. You could, see, you could hear an odd you know, two, three shots being fired because they, they were worried that there may be still some militants because there are uh, underground uh, caverns and there are all kinds of places which are there in the complex that right. there may be still some hiding. They didn't want someone from there to emerge and, uh, you know, pr Ask present a threat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when he came back, as I've recounted, my impression was that he may just resign because the last thing I heard him say before he went upstairs after we came back was, you know, this, these are mistakes of other people, but I'll have to pay the price. Mm. Uh, and that was his last solemn sort of thing. He was obviously upset, shaken, as were all of us. Uh, but by morning, he had overcome it. By morning, he had sort of uh, got over it. And as I said, in retrospect, I think he did the right thing. Uh, right. Because if he had done that, I have no doubt he, he would have ruled Punjab. If Captain Amrinder Singh resigning from a parliament seat mm. could be chief minister for 10 years, Gyaniji resigning for president with his skill set and his command over religion and his public speaking skills, uh, he would have ruled for the rest of his life. He would have been chief minister of Punjab. But he gave up all that for the nation because he didn't want to do that. He realized his own people will be upset with him in Punjab and they were. They right. said he's the, everybody constitutionally says he's the commander in chief. The yeah. fact that nobody asked him and the army went into the golden temple without even the president being informed. Nobody did tell the people. No, if he resigned, he could say that. Absolutely. But then that is really breaking the Sikhs from the nation. Yeah. Or he could swallow it, which he did, which alone should have been enough. Hmm. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi probably understood it, but alone should have been enough for Rajiv Gandhi to realize that this man has stood with the nation. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, just, just one second. So, Ambassador, let me uh, take you a little bit um, to beyond the Zelsing years, and you recount how over the decades, from the time Jawaharlal Nehru as India's first Prime Minister and Rajendra Prasad as India's first President, had a pretty convivial relationship despite the Hindu Code Bill, uh, which Rajendra Prasad was not happy about. And then you come down to the time when Atal Bihari Vajpayee is uh, Prime Minister and Kiar Narayanan is president. And you talk about how the president sat on the Vajpayee government's proposal to give the Bharat Ratna to Veer Savarkar. So tell us, compare and contrast, if you like, the Nehru Rajendra Prasad years to the Vajpayee uh, Narayanan years. No, no, absolutely. I think there is no difference in that. Uh, because it didn't mean that Nehru was comfortable with everything the president told him. But he still went hey, every Monday, if both were in town, the Prime Minister went for half an hour to brief the President. Now, this convention fell by the wayside. Radha Krishnan, of course, had another stature. He brought Mrs. Gandhi in. He is the one who shepherded her rise to Prime Minister's position because he spoke to Kamraj. He spoke to the older generation who respected Radha Krishnan. So she was brought in. But imagine, even she got so upset with him by 1966 that when he died, which I have not put in the book, she never went for his uh, funeral. Mm -hmm. because she was upset over the last public address of his in which he admonished her government mm -hmm. and said there are charges of corruption they are this, you must rectify it and I think Mrs. Gandhi never forgave him even though he helped her become the Prime Minister but the fact remains that these are the two presidents who set a certain precedent of how right. presidents behave it doesn't mean the Prime Minister but to that extent I think Atul Bihari Vajpayee was a great Prime Minister because even when the President dis disagreed with him. He did not get into a confrontation with him. He just backed off. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe he thought that his coalition partners may not agree to that. But I think Vajpayee by temperament was more Nehruvian and more conscious of the institutions. Uh, 
I would imagine even if he had the majority, he may still not have behaved like the other uh, prime ministers who have had a majority. So this proposal to make, uh, to give the Bharat Ratna, to award the Bharat Ratna to Veer Savarkar, uh, posthumously, of course, that didn't go down well with Kiar Narayanan, you say, in the book. No, that's that's in print. I've quoted. These are, this is in public. Yeah. This information is public. It's not something Narayanan told me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's known and it's it's uh, it's it's uh, in print and uh, I've quoted from from there wherever it is mentioned. Uh, but I would imagine they were both like that. Narayanan was very principled. Uh, I'd seen him as ambassador. He was my ambassador, though I was in New York. And then I've recounted many times uh, interaction that I had with him. Right. And it also speaks for Vajpayee. You know, after the first two presidents, I think this was one instance of a prime minister behaving very correctly with the president, even though he's a president whose belief system was probably not fully convergent with the belief system of Vajpayee. Mm -hmm. But they both agreed in the sense that there is a constitution and we are a democracy and we must function according to that own feelings and beliefs aside. And that is, I think, crucial. In recent times, that's probably an excellent example of how a president whose own belief system may be different, own background may be different, a new prime minister has come in, but still they respect the constitutional boundaries. So we have just a few minutes left, Ambassador, but I want you to comment on a couple of instances in your book. Uh, the first is in 1998, then Prime Minister I.K. Gujral's decision to sack the Kalyan Singh government in Uttar Pradesh. And then you come down to 2005 when Bhutta Singh is governor of Bihar and Abdul Kalam is uh, president of the country. He's traveling in Russia. Uh, so tell us, I'm not going to give the story away. T tell us about that. No, these are two examples I've taken. Pranam Mukherjee, who's considered uh, very learned, was considered learned and shrewd man made the mistake in place of Uttarakhand, uh, partly because I think his principal secretary, closest aide, Omita Paul's husband was governor in Uttarakhand. And then the high court uh, overturned it and said there was a test, uh, floor test due next day. How can you impose president's rule? No, this is after you got the Supreme Court guidelines and the Supreme Court judgment uh, on how governors must behave. And still two presidents who were considered very learned and very educated and very suave, both made mistakes because they allowed themselves to be convinced that the government had put out the right decision. So the argument which I make is that Abdul Kalam was a very popular president. Uh, teenagers, children loved him. That presidency is not the, about just the popularity of a president. Rashtrapati Bhavan is not a stage to project yourself as a very humane, educated, nice man. It's, it's a job which is given to you to defend the constitution. So when it comes to crucial decisions, did you take the right decision or not? So later, I think there are press reports. He's supposed to have said, I thought of resigning. But the fact remains that he signed and it was overturned. Uh, and Bhutta Singh had to uh, this thing. So which means the president wrongly signed. Hmm. When it was quite clear that this was a wrong decision. So what use is your being very popular in India? When it comes to a constitutional matter, you do not draw the red line. You may be a very educated scientist. Whereas Gyaniji was not a PhD or a doc didn't have a doctorate. And as I've recounted, is only the second president, uh, which frankly, I didn't know in Rashtrapati Bhavan. I had not read Radha Krishnan's biography at that stage. When Gyaniji got uh, NTR, uh, NTR restored as uh, chief minister and the MLAs all came to Delhi. Now, the first time it happened was the Sutantra party complaining to Radha Krishnan and he got the MLAs to come to Delhi. Right. Probably that also didn't go down well with Mrs. Gandhi. So that is why, you know, that thing developed. So there would always be great presidents uh, will take the crucial decision at a crucial point, which prime ministers may not like, but which they feel is to stop a great constitutional harm being done. And if a president has not done that, then really being suave and being very nice and having a great background and having held great positions, it's no good. So I can't let you uh, uh, go away, Ambassador, without you telling us the story of when Gyanis El Singh met the Dalai Lama. And this is uh, in his time as president, of course, China is opening up. And tell us a little bit about that. 
Well, then you're letting out my whole story there. I know, it's, anyway, a, it's me, a beautiful story. <laughs> yeah. No, no, the Dalai Lama asked him, because, you know, this was 86, I think, 87, when China was liberalizing, this before Tiananmen Square, when uh, Deng was liberalizing. So there was talk at that point that Dalai Lama is being invited. And he confirmed it. He says, you know, uh, should I go to China if the condition is that I can't go to Tibet? And Gyaniji said, the president said, look, uh, I don't know what is the government's thinking. He didn't want to tell him the government is uninterested in my thinking. And nobody is consulting me on anything. So he says that you should ask the government. But if you want my view, I'll give you my view. And there he put together something, the briefing that we had done in case of Gorbachev's visit. Uh, because at that point, uh, we had mentioned that, look, after Perestroika, the attendance of Russian people in churches went up. Mm. So in his mind, he had stored that information. And his view was that if you have a repressive autocratic society, and as you start liberalizing, people tend to turn towards religion. And if China is opening up, then wouldn't Buddhism be an important factor? And I don't think anybody in South Bloc would have thought of this. Uh, this combination, because nobody thinks that foreign policy in South Bloc from domestic politics point of view. Right. It's all seen from the international point of view. And so he told him, he says, listen, tomorrow, if the way China is liberalizing, although now we know it didn't happen that way. Yeah. Because in 89, China took a backward step, but this is pre-89. And so if China had continued like Russia, and which is what the West expected, in fact, that's why they were befriending them. Uh, and if they had gone that way, then yeah. he said, you'll be of relevance to the whole of China. And I think Dalai Lama had not, un had not thought of it from that point of view. That his constituency may be across China, not just in Tibet. Not just in Tibet. Ambassador, I'm going to ask yeah. you to hold the book up once again. The Indian President, an insider's account of the Zell Singh years by Casey Singh. Viewers, I'd really urge you to go out and buy it. The publisher is HarperCollins. Ambassador Casey Singh, thank you so much for speaking to the print. This is a fascinating book thank you. Uh, about mm -hmm. your time in Rashtrapati Bhavan, but across and over the decades. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.